Well, this has um, <laughs> been an interesting couple of weeks. I've enjoyed the conversation coming out of our uh, live show. Um, and I do mean uh, to um, do one a little sooner, like maybe maybe in six weeks or so. But I want to thank you. Anyway, it was a good time. And um, anyway, I do mean to increase our numbers next time. We, we have to do better advertising. I know how to do that now. And, I, uh, and uh, so... Uh, but we had, uh, what we had was all I could have wanted. I know that some of you wanted to be here and missed a little bit, so, um, had various difficulties, I mean to say, so, uh, that's, um, something we'll have to see if it's on our end, we have to do something about. So here we are. Uh, Alan's got a question that it's not surprising that it comes up. I do believe that the discussion of Caravaggio, uh, is important in these times when Trump uh, sort of fool the eye painting is so, so big. I mean, it was bigger earlier. I want to think of people like maybe Brega, um, who was, there are two or three other guys like that, who uh, who paint with heavy influence, apparently, of Caravaggio, and a number of people do. I think one of the reasons you're sort of attracted to Caravaggio is he, he has this uh, doable look about him. It looks like you could do that, although what you're saying, Alan, makes me believe that maybe you think it's impossible. Uh, well, it sounds like you're saying it sounds, could we ever achieve it? But uh, but Caravaggio, Caravaggio stays within his means. He doesn't. He's one of those guys who doesn't uh, go away from the model. Uh, he isn't the guy who's painting from memory at all. He's not the middle and Michelangelo, <coughs> Rubens. He's uh, he's He's I, I want to tell you he was born about the same time as um, Velasquez, so I said I take it that his version of getting more truth in uh, is different from Velasquez, obviously. But over time, he's been a step toward greater truth. I think uh, he's had more influence on the uh, academics than uh, than Velasquez by a long way. I'm talking about the the you know the pre Rome type. Uh, 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 Academics, you know, and so um, uh, as you know, I I consider our stream a different one, but there he is, looking like me drawing from the model all the time. Let's just talk about him a little bit. I have a few pictures for you. Uh, Alan says I've been studying Caravaggio and his still life work, so he gives me the chance to talk about still life, and that's what we're going to do today. He's uh, Alan. You also asked me to talk about perhaps do a show um, uh, uh, setting up. Uh, uh, perhaps a, a still life or something uh, the way the way Caravaggio would have done it. I'm going to take the opportunity. I'm setting. I set a couple up. I'm just going to show you the look of those here. But um, um, so let me get on with that. Um, how did he do it? I mean, the details are unbelievable to me and seem impossible to ever achieve. Now that's obviously something that. Um, is in the bailiwick of a lot of people today who are interested in what I call noodling, you know, fine, fine detailed modeling. Uh, a lot of people are a lot of people are chasing that one down. Maybe the maybe the mainstream of uh, representational painting today is along those lines. Um, um, what was his secret? Did they <laughs> did they paint by candlelight? I, these questions about secrets always uh, blow my mind. But if I, if anybody has any secrets uh, related to Caravaggio, it isn't me. I haven't chased that one. Um, what was the secret? Did they paint by candlelight? And 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 uh, you know that idea is an interesting one in itself. How long should a still life take? I know some master paintings took years to complete. Have we lost our patience? So the presumption is, of course, that this kind of painting takes enormous patience. I won't dispute that it does. That something like that is really so. Not just his, I mean, but good paintings with with a with with fine, with fine and and extended finish. I'll show you a couple of mine to differentiate a little bit toward the end of this. Um, uh, what I was and talk about what I was doing that 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 the evidence is very strong uh, to suggest that he uh, he was also doing Caravaggio was also doing. I don't think things changed much in that world. I mean, I'm saying what we did, what Caravaggio did, what uh, Holbein did, is very similar to what uh, any mural painter would do, and that is basically tracing your drawing onto a whatever you're going to work on, and then and then painting it directly along the lines that you're already set up. Uh, 
as you know, the impressionist model or the, the, the tonalist model, the, what shall we call it, the, uh, the values-driven model, like Sargent's, is a different model than the outline-based one. So none of that should surprise you. You all know me. Um, by the way, I'm not here to criticize anything anybody's ever done. That's not my point. And uh, talking about Caravaggio, it's, I'm just telling you there's a different stream, and his is, his is kind of interesting. It's more like Gamble in a way, in that it's, um, it represents uh, the use of the model at all times in making an imaginative picture, or virtually all the time. And uh, that's a, uh, something feels to lots of us pretty modern. I would suggest to you, of course, that uh, Bouguereau and most of those guys were doing something rather similar. Um, but um, I guess maybe let's see. So if I, let me see if there's anything I should answer here, and then I'll go look at the um, pictures. Um, yeah, detail, detail is not impossible. It's one of the most achievable things in painting. <laughs> uh, but, um, and one of the guys that I was taught mentioning before, maybe it's Breger or somebody, he has this drawing and he says he just paints from the top to the bottom. He paints from left to right or top to corner to, so he doesn't get his paint, his fingers in the, in the, in the wet areas. And um, so uh, uh, those are the sorts of things that you might be sort of unique to that way of picture making. But... You know, the idea that there's a secret uh, in any other way, I don't know what it would be, that what he does to me is blatantly obvious. That's say I think it, you'd find that painting like that is, um, uh, has been done for a very long time. And I'll show you how that is. Um, I would suggest to you that they don't paint by candlelight. I mean, that'd be very difficult. You can't, you'd, you'd have a very difficult time seeing your painting. You'd wear your eyes out in no time at all. The, that's very, very difficult unless you get a, how much candle power would you need? I even find myself that on gray days, my eyes will get really sore. I would be very surprised if anybody of these guys painted by candlelight. Uh, Quentin de la Tour did pictures of candlelight, but my guess is, I've tried to set those up, and I see that you can set them up and have north light on your canvas and, uh, and still have a darkened room that has, you know, where you look, where you darken most of where you're looking through. And you can achieve a candlelight. You can paint the candlelight. I don't see any reason to believe that um, that Caravaggio did anything except paint from a single source, and sometimes a narrow source, which would be the equivalent of a single candle. But it isn't anywhere near that tiny. You know, I say the equivalent only that it's singular and fairly narrow. But candles would be would be different. Um, how long should a still life take? Uh, I don't know if there's a should about anything in painting that way. Uh, I know that when I've mentioned to you Bob Hunter and you see the kinds of, as it were, detail that he gets in his pictures, he'd be a good guy to look at. I don't bring him into this discussion, uh, his pictures, I mean. So you should look at him, but his thing was to produce, I believe, a painting a week, if not a painting every two weeks, which would be a similar thing that I found in terms of my own work, and that is that I can get about, it's about 40 hours, 40 hours of work not not a, necessarily a 40 hours single week thing, but 40 hours of work. So uh, my guess is that Hunter, for example, painted one in the morning and one in the afternoon or some such thing. It was so routine with us. That's, most of us probably did something like that. The light was slight, slightly different on one side than the other. Uh, and um, But I can't tell you that as an insider. Uh, okay. So... I know some master paintings took years to complete, and I suggest to you that what you're talking about probably then is the imaginative pictures. But um, when you're trying to design, uh, who was it I was talking uh, about, uh, reading about uh, recently? I know it's also true of Millet, but he's not the one. But uh, the conversation about pictures being set back, that, you know, and this is usually because you're, uh, it's an imaginative painting. And I've been doing this myself. I have pictures that just sit there for some time while you, don't, while you really are wondering what in the heck to do next. And uh, so that's not actual painting time, though. That's, what do you call it, um, uh, gestation and things like that. Uh, so have we lost our patience as artists? My golly, I don't think so. I think that, um, in fact, <laughs> sometimes I wish we had less. I wish we had more of an efficiency mindset sometimes. But I remember there's always been these two camps. I remember when I was a student, you'd have guys coming in and saying that, and then that took me six months, I painted every day on it. And they wanted praise. And um, other guys would come in and say, yeah, and I did that in two hours. And they wanted praise. <laughs> 
And I suppose you could say the same person might want praise for either one of those things, uh, depending on what their goals were at the time. But I wouldn't put anything, I wouldn't treat ourselves to generalizations like that. I don't think patient, you know, if you actually know what you want and, and, you're, uh, and you're moving along and it's coming your way, you probably aren't going to run out of patience. There is such a thing, I talk about neural energy and you can run out of that. And for that reason alone, I suggest to you that people are uh, hard pressed to just work and work and work and work and then and beat up on things. You just, I found that I myself would just lose control of the good qualities I did have as I would get torturing the painting, but that's a student model, you know. Anyway, Alan, let's talk and all the rest, let's talk about what I found in this discussion. And uh, this is me, uh, I mean, this is the first one, everybody knows this, this famous Caravaggio. This is a, a perfect example of the idea of how important silhouette is, you see how entertaining this picture is, and it's all because of the silhouette, the interest in the silhouette is, is um, it's not everything, but, um, but it's so huge, it's, it's this table setter for this whole painting. And then there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, variable forms and in and out, a little bit of lostness and found in a number of places. And uh, so that, uh, you know, the chiaroscuro, which he's given some credit for being aware of and for being actually, because his picture is frequently a dark, for being a master of, um, I shouldn't make that the reason, but, but um, nevertheless, I'm not showing figurative paintings today, so you can take, uh, you can take uh, this to be, um, you know, generalization that you might not see evidence of here. Still life, according to Reynolds, is um, if you, actually a person who can paint a still life can paint anything. And that's an example, uh, you know, the, the coordinating all the elements into one thing. And Gamow, of course, his quote was, um, it, you, you know, you can only, your picture is only going to be as good as your still life setup. And you can see that he would have set this up and, and then, and then, uh, uh, well, let's talk about what he did in a minute. So I'm going to show you me setting one up. This is my version of it. This is very quick. I'm not trying to compete in one sense. And by the way, you can see my shots are even crooked. Look at this. I didn't even shoot at a horizontal table in front, even though it was right in front of me. So I apologize for that, uh, my neglect there. But, but these are uh, just examples of what we mean by silhouette. This is a pattern-oriented picture. The whole outside of this thing is this fascinating pattern, just like you see in Caravaggio. And then there are internal activities, and I just did that to talk about them, to show, to show you enough of them. You can see that just by rotating this thing a little bit or moving yourself over a little bit, you can get different kinds of shapes. You can get a little more interest in this by turning, you get a little more stuff there in the opening. You get two over here in this case, and you get one breaking out into two in this case. But you can see that by turning yourself a little bit, look at the orientation of this leaf to this. And you can see that there are different uses of these. They may configure in different ways. They make the masses, this mass you can see is more interesting than this one that just blobs onto the other one. I would suggest that that's got more, more interest in it. Um, on the other hand, uh, by turning a little bit, I got more, more of a belly full of good stuff in the center of the picture. <laughs> um, so, um, but that's what he would have done. He would have used a very light background. You can see I just tilted a board back there until it gave me a similar kind of value. Um, I kept my lightest light for the middle. Uh, and um, But uh, that's all there is. You just make a silhouette uh, of your darks. So it's just a pattern cut out, uh, dark on light, and then there are fun inter interplay of middle tones and lights in the middle, creating your area of dominant, of, of, of center of interest area, what we call center, what we think of as the center of, interest or to the point. Uh, what else can I say about this? Um, oh, so the light, I set it up so that the light is coming down. I found, see this angle right here, you can sort of see the angle of the light. My, my window's up, up, up there somewhere. Pretty high north light in this situation. And I just left it, I didn't try to perfect it, but I'm suggesting that you can set one of these up easily enough. Uh, you have to get yourself into, you see this is, I moved over a little bit and this has gotten more light and less dark and you can, f you can copy uh, Caravaggio exactly by just moving yourself over until you have the similar proportion of dark to light. Uh, so the shadow line here is farther to the right and it's here closer to the center. Um, so these are all things you can just do for yourself. Uh, you, the distance you are, um, uh, away from this 
this thing back here. I don't see that I have any cash shadows. Maybe there's a hint of a cash shadow here, but if this wall is far enough back, you don't even get the hint of a cast shadow on the wall, which is what he did. He, he created a very flat picture. Uh, there's a Boston School painter who does that. What is his name? It's not Fred Hall, but books. What's his name? Uh, may come back to me. Who just sort of lived off of this sort of a model, very flat, um, patternistic things. They're very pleasing. Um, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? So the lighting is coming from front, three quarters front or two thirds front and high. So you can cast a shadow down this way. You can see where the shadow, how the shadow line sits. Um, so you can, you get some idea where that light's coming from. And so this is all you really need to know to set it up. And then how, and you make sure you stand back far enough so you can see the thing as a whole, according to um, Da Vinci and other people's advice, uh, taking in the thing as a whole. So you gotta get back quite a distance. Uh, three times minimally the greatest dimension of your subject. All right, let's see what else can I tell you. Um, now I'm just showing you side by side so you can get an idea that um, this is roughly the same idea. You can see that this, by the way, is in, in this representation of it, is a golden picture. Well, this is a, a grayer kind of picture on the red, going toward the dead reds. So a caput mortem kind of a color scheme. Um, so, um, yeah, let's go past, let's go to the next one. So this is one that um, uh, is more typical, and that's why he's asking, uh, Alan's asking the question about the um, candlelight. It's not that, it's not candlelight, or these, light, these effects would be even smaller. It's a pretty big light. In fact, you can see it coming down the wall over here. So it looks like he's got a window above and he's got some blockage of some sort between the wall and, and this group here, like maybe a cabinet or something, has these guys set out on this table, all lit. So that's a pretty good top light. You can see where the uh, shadow line is again. So you can see the, the tilt of the, of the source, light source is like that, right? So the light's, light's up there somewhere, maybe 30 degrees or so. You could look around, look at circles, ovals, that's why you can tell. Look at any of these guys and see if you can see. It's a little hard for me to see um, what other scale this thing is in my picture, but that's what I would use, that one right there. It really looks like a very definitive shadow line. And the axis of the shadow line, see that gives you the angle, that 90 degrees to that gives you the angle of the, of the um, light. But you can see it's also three quarters front light, like the last one, seems to be fairly typical. Uh, you can see in some areas we're completely lost and other areas like the, the dark, the other side of this tomato or whatever it is, it can be seen a little bit. And that's sort of typical. So what he's done is he's made a very dark studio. And let me say that about the other studio, uh, this one too. This could be a really dark studio too. See how dark the shadows are. I'm sorry, I'm looking at mine. See how dark the shadows are. So there's the shadow mass. If you don't have, if ambient light, let's say if your studio is like white like this, these areas will be very pale. And, um, and the darker the general atmosphere that is behind you, be, you know, behind you back here is, uh, if it's more like this space here, that's gonna be a pretty dark light. If it's lighter, these things will be filled with it. Okay, that's called the ambient light. And one of the things you'll want to do if you're trying to set one of these things up is create a studio in which you're basically in a, in a cave. It doesn't have a whole bunch of windows or other bounce light. And, uh, and then uh, make sure whatever you else, else you do, you make sure you can set up your easel in such a way that you can get that same light on your easel. You know, like put your easel to the right to the right over there, uh, to the right of this thing. And, uh, and uh, so that the light that's hitting these guys is also hitting your easel and, not, and avoiding glare on the easel, of course, but just make sure it's hitting your easel. Okay, so that's a dark studio, the light coming from three quarters front and at an elevated height, uh, probably similar to the previous one, about 30 degrees or maybe, or maybe less. Uh, I think that 30 degrees is sort of what, was that, am I right? I'll have to think about that or read that again. Uh, Reynolds recommended that for a studio. He recommended, a, I think, something like a five or six foot window square. And then to have it, I think he said 30 degrees. So in relation to your, in relation to your subject, um, my hand is a subject. You want your light to be coming down at something like 30 degrees. He thought that was good. Now I have the ability to make mine go all the way up to 45 degrees, you know. And, um, but you, you, that's what you can do if you have a tall enough window. Okay, 
but anyway, so that, I think that's that's the basic thing you need to understand. So this is my down below in a comparison. I set something up, and you can see that my ambient light is significantly lighter than his. Um, and uh, I couldn't get for the short term. I couldn't get this. I was trying to do this in something of a hurry, so I couldn't get this this shadow here to do exactly what that did. But you can see I've set up a dark studio. At least the ambient light is generally pretty dark. Not as not as good as that. And then I just went about doing doing what he does, and um, in a, in some rough way, um, I didn't use the same version of a like he uses this like a pusher back these dark leaves in the foreground, and I didn't do that. I I um, there's some dark elements here, but I did use the hanging over the over the edge kind of a thing that he uses. He covered the corner with that, and I guess I didn't. I wasn't m much trying to, but I did give you the corner. This is such a standard to use the corner of a table. It does give you all sorts of interesting opportunities. Um, uh, but yeah, among the other things that you see him doing is he, he uses, like this apple has a nice, interesting, very interesting abstraction. It's a good kind of thing to have in the middle of a picture. I find that the amount of interest in something like this is distracting if this is your center. But on the other hand, this is such chaos. <laughs> it's kind of a relief to get in a place where you can just look at one thing and enjoy it. Uh, anyway, you can see me crudely reproducing the same thing by, by you see, getting a similar kind of a, you see my light slightly more tilted, uh, uh, and um, a similar kind of a, a shadow going, and then just making sure that you have the generally dark stuff over on this side. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what else I can say about that. It's interesting that he didn't make much use of this light that he did create, like he didn't put a dark in here to get himself an interesting silhouette. There's a little hint of one over here, but um, he's mostly living on lights, and a lot of people think of this as the model. And uh, I've had a couple of different students who sort of refuse to leave this model uh, and go for the one, the, more the Degas model, where you have silhouettes in the darks and silhouettes in the light. Uh, I think a more interesting model. What else can I say about this? Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything else I can say about it. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you have to be aware of. Um, oh, I'm just showing this that I, at one point I had uh, had to block this light down here to make my studio have the same dark atmosphere. <laughs> the light was hitting over there, so my guess is whatever he put here did cast a shadow like that. Whatever, well, whatever Caravaggio put over here, because he does have light on the side edge of this object, not a very strong one. He does have light over here, so there's light getting in. This light here is this light here, but something a little bit is blocking it here, and then it comes back here. It could be two windows, but I'm betting against that one. One of the later ones it does look like that. What else can I tell you? This one here is direct, almost direct side light. You see this light coming through here, and I'm not going to analyze this, and I didn't try to imitate it. I do, I do find uh, uh, his stuff to be really chaotic, uh, not having a, what I'd call a, a great center. And when you look at uh, Chardin, you know, you've, you've come a long way uh, uh, toward the, um, you know, toward the uh, a more controlled and more satisfying, for that reason, environment. But this, this spots are just spots. You know, they just, I find this uh, difficult to justify from the point of view of modern composition. Uh, once we get to a certain point, I mean, in our understanding. But uh, just, just a lot of chaos and, you know, he makes some sort of a, of a pyramid, which is sort of some sort of a standard over you know, some part of that era. But, uh, yeah, I find his management of it as a story. Now, by the way, this guy could have been a student and just trying to figure it out. So make sure whenever you do these things, make sure you consider that. But I'm not picking on him except to say this isn't somebody I would model myself after for how to compose a picture. Um, now, how did he do it, uh, Alan? Um, this is probable. Here's, what, 100 years earlier or something? Here's Holbein. Holbein would do a careful line drawing of everything, every little thing, drawing line, 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 line. And uh, just as Caravaggio has done, I'm betting that he did the same thing. He, he, got a, he either did a drawing on the canvas or he did a drawing like we did and traced it onto the canvas. My guess is this was traced onto the canvas from whence this, which is a cropped picture, and I think maybe both of them are, but minimally this is a cropped version. I think there's some hands in this picture. Uh, what is that? Southwell, I believe. Um, nevertheless, um, you can see that that was the model. Everything is about, and Ang does the same thing. He's basically all cut out, 
and then the drawing is what happens inside the cutout, the contours, right? That's the Degas talking and defining drawing. Drawing is what happens between the contours. But there's an implication that we make this very fascinating shape, and we got it. And once we once you workshop, it's one of the reasons I value outline making, just in its, as an exercise, because I don't think unless you if you don't copy like draw do drawings like my students are doing from Cass, if you don't do drawings that are careful in the outline, you'll never understand how much data is in the outline and how much entertainment is all there out there too on these in those silhouetting portions. And that really Caravaggio really gets that, and he's very entertaining. Uh, much like the Greek vase mentality, very entertaining. But anyway, my guess is these were cut out, traced on the, I mean, drawn first on something like we did, and I'll show you what that is in a second. They were traced then, and then they were just simply filled in, hanging on to the lines um, for the most part. I think uh, you'll find that Bouguereau did the same thing, uh, Ang, all, all these guys you'll find. I, I, I don't have any doubt at all that that's what they all were doing uh, post Caravaggio. And maybe thanks partially to Caravaggio, not entirely, of course. Just remember that I was saying this, that fresco painting is, uh, was, was doing that thing where you do a drawing and then you do either a tracing or whatever, and, then, and you pounce and then put through the holes you've made, punching holes along the line, you, you, push, you, you blow that to whatever charcoal, pow, uh, powder that charcoal into the, cra into the holes and it forms your, your uh, tracing. Well, when we did this with Gamel, well, that's what we did. We did this, this, this were drawings on brown fish wrap, you know, just throw away brown paper. And uh, probably some of which is still showing right here. This really isn't a color study. study. I just added a little bit of red and uh, pushed, pushed the whites up. Um, I, I don't know that I ever, maybe I put some yellow in there, but uh, there's no real attempt to make this as a color thing. But anyway, having done this, we then traced it we put a piece of paper carefully on this thing and marked its corners. And this whole paper we were using was already, uh, was going to a canvas that was pre-stretched to this size. So we then traced on tracing paper, these lines, and then either powdered the back of the tracing paper where the lines are with charcoal and pushed them hard, you know, placed this thing on a canvas and then pushed hard on the, on the lines that we had traced. So we would have traced lines right around here, right around here, maybe around, who knows how much, you know. Uh, we, I learned to do much less eventually, but at the beginning, I think we probably went around every single thing that makes a shape in this thing quite carefully. Pressing hard so you had a mark on the canvas, and then we uh, uh, would try to hang on to that as we laid the canvas in. Uh, we may have even retouched it, put a little bit of uh, spray adhesive on it to make it stay, I don't remember. Uh, and then we painted on that. And so this next one is, was probably done that way. And this was my, what I call my graduation piece from the Gamel methods. But this has that kind of a look of a, if, you know, of, of, of the way you, what you see all those paintings are very careful. They're very precise in the outline in all aspects of the line. And then in the, it's similar to that way of thinking that you see in, in uh, Caravaggio, there's this very careful attention to all the little forms. Um, not in a, we definitely weren't painting in a Trump kind of a way, but my goal even in setting this thing up was to have great forms uh, beset with all sorts of other forms, big like this, middle-sized forms and then dinky ones here. Even this thing here, a form with stripes and, and all sorts of other interesting activity on it. So I was looking for an exercise that had enough complexity when I did this, but it was still based on uh, undoubtedly the tracing of the outline. I, <laughs> I can't be held to it because right, I was already in a motion away from that, but I'm quite sure that's what I did here. And then, and this could have taken months to paint. Uh, so to be fair to you guys who are thinking that way, because we didn't really, I certainly in painting, I was trying to figure it out and I wasn't measuring the days. I was doing a little bit of putting marks down so I could, so would know for sure, you know, because the back of the canvas, I'd put one, two, three, and hash, or four, I mean, and hash until you get five, five, five. You know, you can count your, your, the number of days you did, but then sometimes I would forget, and who knows where I wound up. But this one wouldn't have been, this would have been a fairly tedious one. It would have been one of the longer ones I took to make. So it may be answering your question that these, these could take longer, but certainly to noodle them up and extensively would. But this is uh, an example of how I didn't work that way. There's no line initially in this thing. It's mass into line or it's li massed line where you have spots in my classic visual order uh, way of working. 
And I'm, doing, I'm showing you this just to show you that you can noodle up a picture. You can have as much finesse any place you want, like in passages like this. Uh, and as much as you want, you can just keep going and going with that stuff, despite having laid it in more broadly. Uh, so just, just so you've heard that. I think that's all I have for this one. Um, let me fly back to your, um, to your um, question again. Uh, Alan, and see if I've missed anything. This has already been a bit longer than I want to go. So uh, Caravaggio is still like, what are your thoughts on him? How did he do it? I mean, the details are unbelievable to me and impossible to overachieve. I think I've answered all these questions. What was his secret? <laughs> did they paint by candlelight? I don't think there was any secrets in this guy, except that I think his setups were predictable. In other words, he set up models and he used the same light every time. So he wasn't doing invention, and that's what I'm telling you what, what Gamma would do is have these steps, whatever he wants, people walking down steps. And he has the, made sure the lights were the same every time, that the reflected lights on the figure were the same every time, so they would look to be in the same atmosphere. And he was painting them, as it were, impressionistically. He was painting them to look like what he saw. Uh, and um, so I better leave it at that. Uh, how long should I tell you? So I think I've talked about everything. Yeah. <laughs> Don't lose patience. Hang in there, guys. But don't ever underestimate the importance of the still life. Um, you see that in, in the works you've seen here today, that they are complex things. And don't be satisfied with being able to knock off a head and then smear stuff around the background and, you know, that looks artsy. Uh, you know, learn to compose complex pictures and to paint then every part not only right in itself, but right in the context of all the other parts and their form and their, and their uh, sizes and their colors and chromas and shapes and so on. And, um, you know, you'll be forced to actually learn to integrate the abstractions the way I talk about it. If you do that, you'll find their best practices are, are really going to come your way. Probably, probably, um, uh, more evidently than coming Caravaggio's, I mean, than, than, than it is to do it this way. But I would say that the still life is what you should use uh, to get yourself there. Uh, imaginative painting does definitely uh, work more like what, what you see Caravaggio doing in the sense that you do drawings and you do tracings and you can then place them on side by side by side, things that were never side by side, you can put them into the picture. There's no evidence that that's what Caravaggio was doing, but I'm saying that that approach that he takes through the whole bind tracing and then putting in the picture. You see Puvis doing that. You see lots of people doing it. I recommend you do look at Puvis with all those careful outline drawings, all the pieces, all the players on there. And then presumably that being that whole thing being traced or uh, transferred by somebody up onto this big screen, onto the big canvas or the big wall, and then uh, painted an area at a time, probably an object at a time. Okay, now I'm saying stuff we didn't start, to, start out to say, so. Let's leave it at that. Thank you all for your donations. It was great seeing and hearing from all you guys. Uh, thank you for your nice comments. I hope this is somewhat helpful to you guys who are maybe just beginning, maybe had some other ideas. Uh, maybe there are ideas here for people who aren't just beginning. But if you haven't been a still life guy, I do recommend it. I think somebody online said they were, was that you, Theodore, or, or uh, Sheila, one of you guys, <laughs> one of you ladies, uh, said that you were going to take some time and, and set something up. And I really, really hope you will. And I hope this helps a little bit with that effort. Thank you all, and see you next time. Oh, don't forget, don't forget, sorry, don't forget to subscribe, to share, to uh, comment, and all the rest of those things that are provided for there. Uh, okay, all right, um, and donate, of course, yeah. Um, next time, have a good week.